you have your Bible, let us look quickly tonight in the St. Mark 3, verse 24, I believe. St. Mark 3, verse 24. The Bible said, and if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. In Matthew 6, verse 24, we read a familiar scripture there. Matthew 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Exodus 20. Reading in several places, a good atmosphere to preach some holiness around here tonight. Amen. Exodus 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of any thing that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. This be the iniquity of the fathers upon the children through the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And then in the fifth chapter of 1 Samuel, fourth chapter of 1 Samuel, if you please, <clears throat> Got a hold of this little part a few weeks ago. Felt like maybe I ought to preach it here tonight. First Samuel four, verse ten. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. There was a very great slaughter, for well, there fell of Israel thirty thousand footmen, and the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Listen now, in the fifth chapter. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it unto the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod and destroyed them and smote them with him rods even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us, and upon Dagon our God. They sit therefore and gather the Lord of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. I want to preach tonight on this subject. Two gods in one house. Two gods in one house. The Bible tells us that no man can serve two masters. You're either going to hold the one and despise the other, or you're 
you're going to love one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and man. God said, I am a jealous God. Don't you make you any graven images, any likeness of things in heaven or earth, and bow down to them. For I am a jealous God. You might say, Brother Rich, I'm not going to tell you what side I'm on. I'm going to tell you you're on one side or the other. And if you're not on God's side, you're on the devil's side. You're either serving God and living for Him and you're a child of God on your way to heaven, or you're living for the devil and you're a child of the devil and you're on your way to hell tonight if you do not change. Are you with me and listen to me preach tonight? Too many people have reached a place where they walk to God in the same house. But the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And he further declared in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, he said these words in verse 17, If any man defile this temple, him will God destroy. In 2 Corinthians 6, 16, the Bible said, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of God. Bible readers and those that are familiar with the Bible, you know the Ark of the Covenant, amen, signifies the very presence of God. When God was uh, in Israel and gave commandments concerning the Ark of God, it was so His divine presence could come down and dwell among the people. Listen to me closely now. Amen. But there came a day when Israel forsook their dedication. They forsook their consecration to God. They, they forsook their holiness to God. And the Bible tells us, amen, that they went out to battle against the Philistines and the ark was not with them. And when they went out to battle against the Philistines without the ark, they were smitten of the Philistines. And they said, let us go and get the ark and bring it in the camp that we can win the victory. But I want to tell you tonight, unless you are keeping God's commandments and keeping your dedication and consecration, even the presence of God cannot help you. For they went and brought the ark back into the camp, and the people shouted with a great shout, and the earth rang out, amen, but God was not there. And when they went out to fight against the Philistines, the Philistines overtook them and took the Ark of the Covenant away, as they did, and Hophni and Phinehas, they were the sons of Eli, the priests, were slain, and you know the story, they were one of them wives was having a child, and when they heard that the Ark had been taken away, Eli fell off of a high place and break his neck, and this woman was giving birth, and they named the child Ichabod because the glory of God had departed. But listen now, the Philistines have the ark. They've got the ark now. They don't belong to the children of Israel. They've got it. And now what are we going to do with the ark of the covenant? I'll tell you the ark was a glorious thing. When Israel was keeping the commandments and statutes of God, and they bear that ark upon the priest's shoulders, when their feet touched the waters of the river of Jordan, the Bible said the waters opened up, and they went up top on dry ground. But now they lost the ark of the covenant, and here comes the Philistines, and they take that ark, and they bring it down into the land of the Philistines. But where are they going to put the ark? They said, where can we put this ark? They said, we've got to have a place to put it. And finally someone said, we'll put it over there with Dagon our God in his temple. They said, now that might have been all right if they'd have moved out Dagon and cleaned out the abominations and the filthiness that was in the temple. They said, and let God's spirit and God's power have right of way. But notice what they did. They brought the Ark of the Covenant down and they set it up with their God, they 
Dagon, right in the temple of Dagon, and we have two gods now in the same house. Oh, stay with me. I'm going to preach to you tonight. And then we have two gods now in the same house. What's going to happen? They leave the Ark of the Covenant there. They been right in the presence. They been, let me use this, brother, brother. Take this thing out for me. Amen. If you can, amen. Uh, just that still. Praise yes, sir. Amen. They had two arts. Can't do that's all right. Amen. They've got two gods now in the same house. And so, when they get up the next morning, they say, we'll go down and look and see how we got along with two gods in the same house. When they got down there, they found that old day down their God had fell over in the presence of the God of heaven. And they looked and said, oh, they got our God had fell over. Mistake number one, they brought the ark of God and put it in the house of Dagon without cleaning up the house. Here's mistake number two. They come back to their God and they set him back up in his place. Are you listening? They set him back up in his place, restored him back to power. Let me tell you this. I believe that God helps a lot of folks. We come to the camp meetings. We see people pray in the altar. And it seems like they get a good touch from God. And we say, my, look, God's knocked down. Even the sins in their life, look at them. They've really touched God. And then next day we wonder, well, did they really get any help at all? I believe God in His presence. They did not knock down some of the sins in their life. But they stood those sins right back up as soon as they got out of the house of God. Listen now. And so they said, we'll try it again. We'll put they down here and the ark here again. And we'll leave the ark of the covenant right in here. We've still got two gods in the same house. And they left it overnight again. And they got up the next morning, and old Dagon had fell over again. And the stump was all that was left. And over by the threshold of the door, they found old Dagon's hands and his head. You can believe what you want to, but I believe that smoker was trying to get out of the presence of Almighty God. They've been trying to get away from the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God's power was there. And now we had it. Trying to get out. What I'm trying to tell you, brother, two gods cannot stay in the same house. Listen to me. Listen to me. Some of you that come to this camp meeting and some that fell in this altar last night, I know a lot of you got help. Some of you was in a backslidden condition in your heart, and some of you are here tonight. And God done something for you. But I do not care how great a deliverance you have if you do not take old day John and drag him out of the house and set God on the throne in your life. Brother, you'll be right back in the same old sins and right back living the same old life that you've been living. Oh, I'm going to help me now. I'm preaching on two gods in the same house. It won't work, brother. Oh, yes. Some come, and uh, they've got habits in their life. Oh, and we pray for them, and it really looks like God touching them. But they can't always wait to get out into that car. And sometimes don't wait to drive off the ground till they fire up their God. <laughs> Hand it back up. Yes, yeah, God really helped me. But I stood my God, day God, right back up in his place. Oh, listen, if you want victory, there's one lesson you must learn. Two gods cannot stay in one house. No man can serve two masters. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of the devil. You cannot drink the devil's cup and the Lord's cup, brother. You've got to make up your mind what God you want. Amen. And hold on to God. Listen to me. The Philistines 
made mistake number three. They said they got more sense than a lot of our church folks have. They said, wait a minute. This is not going to work. Two cops in this same house. That's not going to work. It's getting too rough on our day, God. Woo! That broke his hands off. That broke his head off. Why didn't just throw a rope around him and pull that fell on out the door? His hands was already over there. His head was already over there. Why didn't he go and pull his stuff out? Let me tell you, mistake number three. They knew they could not have two gods in one house. And they said, one God's going to have to go. But they got rid of the wrong God. Oh, people come to our church. They feel this service like we feel tonight. They feel a whole time conviction. And they get miserable in their soul. And say, my, I can't go on living like this. I've got to live better. I'm miserable, I'm miserable, I'm miserable. One of these gods has got to go. But so many times they get wrong, rid of the wrong God and go back to their sins and back to the world. Oh, yes, I'm going to preach a while tonight. I'm preaching on two gods in the same house. Here in this camp meeting, Brother Butler, I appreciate you. You can't have two gods in this place. You can't put a, a bomb pad Amen, woman, where it was lipstick. Amen, and eye makeup. Rings don't have a finger. Amen, and maybe bells on her toes. Amen, with a, a short thick skirt over here on the piano. And put a good hole in this woman over here on the organ. You've got two gods in the same house. And you can't have the glory of God until you get rid of one of those gods. I'll tell you tonight, brother, our charismatic friends. They may be shouting, they may be rejoicing, but we know as holiness people that they've got two gods in the same house, and it's not going to work. One of them is going to have to go, and I'm afraid the wrong God is going to be restored back to power. Woo! Two gods in the same house. I looked at the choir. When it came up, I watched it. I know at times there's new ones and new converts that we must work with. I know that. But I watched the choir. And I'm now, wait a minute. If he puts us up here, up there, a bunch of old boys with long, shaggy hair. And I've seen some of them here uh, in a place not too long ago. Collars and shirts unbuttoned down to almost the navel. They've been paid for haircuts. Gold chains are hanging around their necks and put them up to entertain a group of holiness people. Brother, you've got the two gods in the same house and one of them has to go. But I declare unto you tonight, amen, if you get in this altar, they going to go down. And a good time to put in a little puck for sanctification if you won't go back and send him back up. Amen. God will rule and reign in your heart. Amen. And you'll find victory in your soul. And God will take control of your life. Amen. And you'll have the victory in a world full of sin. But regardless of how great your deliverance is, if you send your God back up in their place, you'll not have victory. And that old habit will begin to rule again in your life. And you'll be right back in the home pits of sin. Two gods in the same house. Young people, you can't listen to those rock and roll records and then come down here and sing, Have you received the power since you believe? Well, the Horton two gods in the same house won't work. Hallelujah. I'm talking from experience now. Let me tell you something. When I got saved, and it's going to give away my age. When I got saved, I like them old country and western songs. One of my favorites was old Ernest Tubb. And he was singing, I'm walking the floor over you. I can't sleep a wink that is true. I just keep on hoping and praying till my heart breaks right in two. But I'm walking the floor over you. I like Dorn. I like to hear him say, 
Pick it out over there, Billy Bird. Pick it out. But you see, God saved me. I said, God saved me. And I must be honest. There at the altar, amen, many, many things in my life went down. But oh, and I'm sure old day God earned fell too. But the next morning on the way to work, I stood that fellow back up again. Amen. I'm such a major looking for Ernest Tom. Sing about it, Ernest. Take it out, Billy Bird. Amen. And I wonder why with the church on the next service night and they sang the songs of dying and I couldn't seem to get in just right. Oh, you're going to stay with me and let me preach to you. I couldn't seem to get in there just right. Amen. But I kept working on it. And I got into all of a few nights later. And I stayed there to God gloriously done something in my soul. I felt such joy. I left out of that place. And for a few days, I didn't even try to listen to words. But one morning on the way to work, I just wondered if I could find old Tubbs on that this morning. See the sky down low and church. And you know, you wonder why you feel lower as you listen to him, you know. See the kind of low I listen to word. And I got to listen. And finally, I got to set him back up again before I got back to work. Now, I tell you, he was popular in those days. Yes, he was. He was mighty popular. And I said, old day got back up. But you see, the preacher was pushing me. Here, yeah, I've got a young businessman here in my church making good money. When God saved me, I didn't start paying 10%. I started paying 20%. So glad, brother Fred, over there on the coast to be saved and living for God, I started dropping in 20% of my earnings. And here my pastor was pushing me. And all the time I thought, oh, if he knew I had old David in here, he wouldn't be pushing me. And every time he'd call me to do something in the church league testimony service, I'd feel so bad because I knew I had two gods right there in the same house. Oh, and this thing began to work on me. And I began to seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it worked and it worked and it worked on me. And I thought one day, I'm going to get rid of this once and for all. I went to church that night and I told our pastor, I said, is it all right if I stay tonight at the church and pray? He said, sure, stay right here. And so, uh, after service, everybody left. And I sent Sister Rich on home. Everybody left and I stayed there and the pastor stayed. And I oh, no, I don't want him here. They've been liable to find out about my day gone. They've been liable to find out that I've got another God over here in my house. I said, Brother, there's no use of you saying. Go on home. Get you some rest. They said, Well, Brother Rich, I don't feel right about going home and you're up here praying. I'll just stay and pray with you, he said. I said, Oh, no, please go on home. Leave me alone. I'll be all right. Just let me pray. Something personal. He said, No, I'm not going to go home. I'm going to stay here until you touch God. So I nailed in that altar and I began to pray real quietly. And real quietly. And finally, that blessed pastor, let me tell you something, pastor, no more than you think they know. He walked over and with a loving hand, he patted my shoulder and he said, Brother Don, you're having trouble with that old country western music, aren't you? And I broke down and I wept and cried like a baby. But I'd like to tell you, and I prayed until old day God went down. And over 20 some years has passed, and I never have sent him back up again in my life. What I'm trying to tell you, brother, you cannot have two gods in the same house. If you want to live like the world, look like the world, dress like the world, you can have the world, but you can't have God. But if you want to dedicate your life and be 
gonna bow a little while before that God over there in the corner, before they go to bed. They know they've got to get up early. But it don't matter. They've got to give a little worship. they got to give a little worship to their God over there. Amen. Before they go to bed, bow down, turn old Jay John's knob. Amen. And then they wonder when they come to church, I don't really get much out of the service. You can't get much out of the service with two gods in the same house. Woo! Say, what can I do about it? I'll tell you what you can do about it. You can go home right tonight, and the pastor and I'll go with you if you want us to. Amen. And we'll help you move old day God out. Amen. That shell television out of your house. And you can come back here tomorrow night and shout the high places of God and enjoy the glory of the Lord. Two God cannot stay in the same house. I was in a certain church and there's folks here about Call the name of the church and verify. I was in a certain church and, and I was preaching against television. And there were several folks right in that meeting got rid of. But there was a deacon in that church that had one. A lot of folks didn't know they had it. But one preacher friend of mine was staying with him. And he said, We got up the next morning. Started to the camp meeting day service and said this brother went out, unlocked the trunk of the car, carried a big old television, and said, I didn't say nothing to him. He didn't say anything to me. Got things in toes. 
Amen. We want to come right in among you and worship with you. If we allow it, it won't be long until those two gods will be having a battle over the priorities in the church. And the world will rob the church of its spirit and its power with God. When that whale, when that whale, somebody said it's just a great thing. Uh, Jesus said it was a whale. When it followed Jonah, now I know Jonah was going the wrong way, but he made a confession. He said, it's my fault. It's the cause of me. But all this tension is upon it. The Bible said, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring that boat to land. I preached one time on God blowing and men rowing. I don't care how hard you row, if God's blowing, you're not going to get to shore until you separate one of those gods. Are you listening? So they sent old Jonah and threw him overboard. And here comes the quail. And he swallowed up Jonah. Now when that quail hit that old Jonah swallowed him up, his intentions were simply this. I'll make this man part of me. He's in me now. I'm going to apply the digestive juices to him. <laughs> You're all going to let me preach to you, aren't you? I'm going to apply the digestive juices to him. And I'm going to assimilate him. He'll just be part of me. I'll be bigger than I've ever been. My appetite will be satisfied for a while. Amen. Here I've got me a good meal. I don't know how much Jonah weighs, but probably a pretty good sized man. Said, here I've got me a good meal. I'm just going to assimilate him. Amen. Pie these just digestive juices, and he's going to be just like I am. And he's going to be part of me. Amen. I'm going to take him into me. And he'll be just part of my rib cage, part of my muscle, part of my bone. Amen. Jonah, that hole in the preacher is going to be part of me. But oh, that hole in the preacher began to break. <laughs> and the digestive juices would not work. Amen. And he couldn't get oh Jonah to become part of him. So he said, there's only one thing to do. I've got to get this hole in the preacher out of me and back up on the bank. Amen. He's going against me. He's going against me. Me and the Bible says that he went up and Bob said, Jonah, you don't understand what I'm preaching, but I'd like to tell you tonight that if we allow the world, we'll just become part of the world. But if we'll pray, the world will realize that they can't have God's people with his power and with his anointing and with his still Holy Ghost in their midst. And we won't have to separate, they will separate from us. Am I preaching right tonight? Two gods in one house. Not going to work. Try it in your church. But it won't work. Somebody said, well, now what we need, and I know some of our good pastors, brothers, have taught us a lot of good things. And they've got a lot of good principles. Some of them running Sunday schools as high as 10,000 people. And somebody got the idea now that we need to send the whole industry up to their schools to learn how to build a church. Oh, hallelujah. You know what I'm talking about, Brother Ralph Horton. They really think what we need to do now is send our good whole industry preachers sanctified tongue-talking. Amen. Holy Ghost, devil fighting. Those that preach the old black back book. Amen. Heaven high, hell hot, gun barrel straight. Send them up there and let those fellas teach us how to build a church. Oh, I'm going to tell you, if we take our instructions from those that are lower than us, amen, and standards lower than us, eventually we'll become like them. And part of them, I say tonight, the only recipe we need is to go back to the upper room and be in tune with power from on high and leave old St. John laying down and rise up in the power of the Holy Ghost and preach God's word and win the victory even in 1983. Two God, one out. I guess I'm preaching too long. 
and preaching on the radio in Kansas City. A lady called, said, Brother Rich, she was weeping. Brother Rich, you don't know me, but I listen to your program every day. I love the Lord. I love him with all my heart. But she said, right here in my house, I'm a widow. And I've got a son that's devil possessed. And said, when I began to pray, he just sold the top of me and cursed me and blasphemed God while I'm trying to pray. And said, I can't go on. Brother Rich, can you cast out the devil? And honestly and sincerely, I said, Sister, I cannot. But I know one who can. And she said, would you come and cast the devil out of my son? We can't both go on living in the same house. Said, he beats me. I have abrasions on my body, cuts and lacerations. Would you come today? And I said, no, I won't come today. Let me take your phone number. If you have one, she gave it to me. I said, I'll call you when I'm ready to pray for your son. So, Brother Rick, why didn't you rush right over there? I wanted to make sure there wasn't no day God in my life before I rushed over there. And in that old church, 646 Ohio, Kansas City, Kansas, I spent all night in prayer. And I asked the church to pray with me. You know, some did, some could care less. But the folks got victory or not, but some really prayed and fasted, sought God. After about three days of prayer and fasting, God told me, said, I'm going to give you the victory. Go ahead and call the sister. I'm going to give you the victory. I called her and told her, I said, immediately after my radio broadcast, as soon as I get through preaching today, I'll be right over to your house. Took her address, drove over, and when I pulled up into the driveway, this little woman met me out in the yard, began to show me her legs and her body, and then the back of her head, just about the size of a good apple. Her son in one of his devilish tantrums had pulled a clump of hair out of her head and left it bald. And I could tell by looking at you the good holiness woman. And she said, Brother Rich, we can't go on. Nothing's gonna be done. I said, Sister, just hold on. God's getting ready to work. Just hold on. Walk into that house for the Gary and field. And coming out of a room, bedroom on the side came a man larger than myself. I started to speak to him, and God said, don't talk to him. Don't set up no communication. Now, I know Jesus talks to spirits, but God told me not to set up no communication. And when he came by me, the Lord is my witness. I just simply laid my hand on him, and I, I said, devil, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Brother Crane, that man would not have went down any harder. If someone would hit him with a 16-pound sledgehammer, he went down on that living room floor, and he laid there like a corpse. The color drained from his face, and I looked at him, and I could feel that spirit moving out of there. This woman, this precious mother, she began to walk around that young man, her son, and say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This went on for a good while. I know there's no use of her praising him alone. I got right in behind her. Here two of us was now. Saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. After a while, a third voice joined us. And I looked, and coming out of the lips of that man was those precious words. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The last time I heard from that young man, he called me. It was on Sunday morning. Said, Brother Rick, guess what? I'm on my way to church again this morning. Ever since you prayed for me, I took Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I'm happier than I've ever been. But I'm trying to tell you, two God cannot stay in the same house. One of them has got to go. But the one of them has got to go. and wheat down by the wine press. They been hit down there from the Mennonites. Listen, Brother Craig. The Mennonites had come up on them. The turn of Israel about the time of heart. And they increased away. Here Gideon was. Down here fresh and wheat to hide from the Mennonites. 
But the angel of the Lord spoke to him. He sent him and spoke to him. He said, I mind you, man, I'm The Lord is with me. He asked the same question I've asked many times. If the Lord is with us, then where be all the miracles that our fathers did when they come out of Egypt? Have you ever asked that question? If God is with us, then I'll tell you why you're not seeing the miracles. Right over there in your daddy's back door, you've got a grove that's grown there for idols, and you've got an altar there to the idol of Baal. Do God won't work to him. But God put it in Gideon's heart. I'll not have time to go into all of it. He didn't do it in the daytime. He did it at night. But thank God he did it. Took two of his father's uh, yokes of his father's oxen, two big oxen. He went out there. One of them he hooked that old altar of Baal and drug that thing out with the ox. <laughs> How big an ox would it take to drag your day down out tonight? Hallelujah. I'll tell you the power of the Holy Ghost can do it tonight. Drug down that altar and drug it out. Cut down that grove, Brother Thompson. And when the sun come up the next morning, he had an altar built. And this time a sacrifice, another book, laying on that altar. And praise going up to the God of heaven. And God said, all right, get in. You just take it. I'm not going to all the story. But since you've just got one God and it's me, I'm going to let you take 300 men. And you're going to defeat it. That whole entire host of the Midianites. Amen. Let me tell you something. Regardless of the number, if there's just one God in the house, and that God is the God of heaven, it's enough to win the victory over the devil any time. Let me hurry with this. Time to close. Oh, I've got many things. Deuteronomy 27, 15. Curse be the man that make of any graven or molten image and put us in a secret place. Mm. A lot of folks come to holiness church. They got a good holiness dress. I mean, men look good, good clean haircut. But somewhere in the secret place of their heart, they've got their eyes. And John, writing to us, said, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Oh, let me tell you. The reason the church has been robbed of its victory many times, there's been secret day gods in the hearts of the people that's kept us from the power of God. One other thing, and I'm going to try to close. Oh, listen to me. There's been some great revivals. There's been some great things happened in the days of Asa. There was a great revival. You know why they come a great revival? The first thing that Asa did, listen, he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all of the idols that his fathers had made. Brother, would it bring a revival in our days? Would it bring a revival in our days? I believe it still would. Under the reign of Jehu, the Bible said they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal. And made it a drop house under this day. Under Jehodiah, the Bible said all the people of the land went into the house of and break it down, his altars and his images, and break it into pieces. So early. Under the reign of Josiah, great revival sprang out, but here's why. The king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the doors to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for the Lord and all the vessels that were made for Baal. Hear it? And for the grove and for all the hosts of heaven, and he burned them out of without Jerusalem in the fields of kitchen and carried the ashes of them under Bethel. Amen. Every time there's been a revival, one God had to go. Hear me, hear me. Jehoshaphat, nevertheless, in the days of Jehoshaphat, nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. In Hezekiah's brain, you know the story. They cleanse the temple of God. And the Bible said, even as they break the images in pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places and the altars out of Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim also and Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. Under the reign of Ezra, hear me, 
Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God and put away all the wine and suck our born of them. All the wise, if we would clean up the church from the adulterers and the adulteresses and the fornicators and the hormonters, it would still bring revival under the reign of Nehemiah. Here came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut. I charge that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants sent I at the gate that these should, should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. Amen. A day dedicated back to God. Under the reign of Jesus. Our God doing all of them. But under the reign of Jesus Christ, he went into the temple and he drove the money changers out. Made him a with a small court and gathered them and sold in the temple of God. Take me, say, this make not my father's house a house of merchandise. For it is written that my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Oh, too many gods in this house. Are you hearing me tonight? Amen. Amen. I better close. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I believe tonight I'll not go into the rest of it. But we can have a revival that will get rid of the right God. Amen. That day God. How many have some day gods in your life that need to go down tonight? Amen. Maybe you've got a temper. Maybe you've got a little hatred, a little jealousy, a little envy, a little desire for the things of the world. Maybe a little desire to look like the world or go to the worldly places. Amen. Or be seen with the worldly people. You need to get rid of one of those gods tonight. And I believe if you'll come at this altar and seek the Lord, that before this altar service is over, if you'll pray sincerely, oh, thank God's going to go down. And if you don't stand him back up again, he'll stay down. But if you build again the things which you once destroyed, you become a transgressor. Oh, tonight, I feel like we ought to have a time of repentance. You can do what you want to. But, brother, you know I preach the truth. We're living in an age when they're trying to put two gods in the same house. Amen. And we're trying to pattern after the world and the things of the world. Can't you see what robbed the modernistic church of the power? It is the world. I'm going to make a statement some of you may never believe, but the devil will never drive the Spirit of God out of my life. He won't know, sir. Only when I yield and set back up those days will the Spirit of God go from my life. Love, oh, brother. God is a supreme being in my life. Oh, our spirit's going to stay with me. Some of you tonight, you're bothered by some things. I was preaching along these lines. See Brother Jack back here tonight. I was preaching along these lines up there in Virginia. And a young man in the congregation went home that night and told his dad and mama, said, Mama, you've been laying here sick a long time. And Daddy, Daddy was a preacher, said, Daddy, to God can't stay in the same house. Daddy, we've got to get rid of these gods around here. And they started loading them up, brother. Started picking up those gods. I don't know how she's doing now, but when we left them there, brother, she was doing good, doing much better. I'm telling you, if we want the power of God, there must be a purging. There must be a cleansing. Say, yeah, Brother Rick, every time we hear you, it's the same old stuff, the same old stuff. It's going to keep on being the same old stuff until the power of God is restored back to the church. And the glory of God once again is made available to God's people. And it will only come through dedication, sanctification, consecration, and an old-fashioned altar. Let us stand.
Thank you so much. What a joy to sing songs like that. I had the privilege of writing that song. It's been a great blessing to thousands of people. Here's a song called about the grave. We didn't bury it and all these things. It's similar to us all. And I should be caught up in the rapture. But this